I have the pleasure of introducing Paul Cahill. So Paul um, is going to be um, speaking to us today. His topic is Tales from the Trenches, Two Medical Malpractice Trials in 2022. A little bit about Paul. So Paul Cahill has been a partner at Will Davidson LLP since 2011, having started his legal career there as an articling student in 2004. Paul practices in all areas of personal injury, with a specific focus on medical malpractice. Paul's advanced advocacy skills, both inside and outside of the courtroom, have led to him being recognized by the Law Society of Ontario as a certified specialist in civil litigation. Paul has proven his acumen for trial work through several successful trial outcomes over the years, and this has led to him being recognized by his peers and numerous publications, including Best Lawyers in Canada for Personal Injury Litigation in 21 and 22, and Medical Negligence um, and Lexpert in 22. Welcome up, Paul. Uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Controller. Okay. Can wait. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank Richard Halpern and the Gluckstein Lawyers for having me here. Uh, it's a real pleasure, and I want to say that the presentations I've been hearing and Mike's presentation, Dr. Schifferman, and everybody uh, has been amazing. And this is my first time at this conference. I got to say I'm really impressed, and I'm really uh, honored to be part of this amazing faculty. And I hope that my presentation can can add a little bit of value to everybody here. So I want to talk today about my experience in 2022. I had the pleasure of doing two medical malpractice trials this year. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about my experience with them. Uh, I want to tell you some of the facts about them and sort of the ups and downs and what I learned um, doing these two trials in this year. If anyone has any questions throughout or at the end, I'd be happy to canvas them. I'm going to start with my first trial. This was called uh, Knight uh, versus Lawson, and it was in May of 2022. And the facts of the case were that the, the plaintiff suffered an injury to her right ureter during a laparoscopic assisted vaginal hysterectomy performed by the defendant. The injury was not identified intraoperatively, nor was it, nor, nor was it suspected five days later when she presented uh, to the defendant with a, what, I, what I called a trial, a textbook presentation of a ureteric injury. She had post-operative unilateral flank pain, and there was a pelvic CT showing hydronephrosis and hydroureter. I'm just going to show this medical illustration, which was part of the trial, and just sort of talk about the facts in a little bit more detail. One of the things that I love doing uh, whenever I go to trial is I love getting medical illustrations. Uh, I don't know if all lawyers like to do that, but I like to do that. And I do it because I feel like it allows me to focus the med medical issues in a way that I hope can persuade and inform the trial judge and the jury about what we're talking about. And one of the things I always find with medical illustrations is I spend a lot of time preparing them. Uh, getting them ready, sometimes fighting with the opposing counsel to having them admitted into evidence or, or relied on at trial. Uh, but usually by a few days in, we're not really looking at them anymore. People kind of absorb it and learn it and understand it. It doesn't become such an issue. But in this case, this was one of the uh, important uh, medical illustrations because in this case, there were really two standard of care issues that were advanced. The first standard of care issue was the surgery itself. So there was a ureteric injury during an LEVH. And the plaintiff's position was that that should have at least have been identified intraoperatively and repaired initially. And had that been done uh, initially, uh, this lady wouldn't have had the uh, complications that she sustained. Uh, I'll say, you know, the, the decision is under reserve, so I don't know the outcome yet. I think that that aspect of the case wasn't quite as strong as the uh, misdiagnosis that happened five days later. So what happened was uh, this lady had her surgery and she was sent home and she comes back. Uh, with, with unilateral flank pain, so sort of up in this area. And she goes through the hospital system and, you know, talking with Richard about sort of innocent causal you know, events or there's a number of innocent causal events that led her back to the defendant surgeon. And prior to coming back to the defendant surgeon, they, they did a CT of her abdomen. And so the defendant surgeon receives the patient back five days after the surgery with, with the CT imaging. Uh, and it, it says that there's hydronephrosis, hydroureter, and an abscess. And what this illustration depicts are, are those three elements that were noted on the uh, CT report. And to be fair, the, the surgeon didn't actually have the imaging, not that it mattered. They had the report that identified these three 
uh, abnormal findings. What the defendant physician did in response to that was focus on the abscess and said, oh, there's an abscess. Uh, I, I should treat that with antibiotics. And so she kept the patient in hospital for a few days, treating her with antibiotics, uh, and then sent her away. She comes back two weeks later, and she's in, in, in a bad shape. Uh, and a, more imaging is done, and now there's a rupture of a ureter. There's fluid in her uh, abdomen, uh, and she goes on to develop a fistula. Uh, she has multiple urological interventions and basically lives a life of a terrible year uh, of uh, complications. But ultimately makes a pretty decent recovery, but has a very bad uh, ureteric rupture and, and, and needs reimplantation uh, because of the delay, as we say. And one of the critical issues in this case was the reasonableness of the surgeon to focus on the abscess as the most important and treatable uh, radiological finding five days after an LAVH surgery, which is known to cause ureteric injuries and kind of ignore the other stuff, like the hydrouret and the hydronephrosis. And that was really the, the focus of the trial in terms of the liability, was why was it, why were you focused on this abscess and didn't consider the other, the other elements? And so uh, she ends up having this bad outcome, which, uh, which I described. The trial itself was an eight day bench trial. Uh, before Justice Daw and Barry. And this, I think, might have been one of the first few post-COVID in-person trials. So it was in person. We only did one uh, day of evidence by Zoom, and that's because my expert ended up with COVID. And so he wanted to do it by Zoom, and everyone agreed that's probably for the best. Uh, but the rest of the trial was in person. Uh, and it was, a, it, was, it was really odd being in the Barry Courthouse. There was no one there. It was empty. Actually, sorry, there was a family law trial going on next door. Uh, and the family law lawyer was always stopping us and talking about his case. And we're like, okay, we got to get back into the courtroom. Uh, you know, uh, but it was very much, uh, very much different kind of feeling being in the courthouse post COVID. Uh, damages were not settled. And this is sort of a, uh, an unusual situation for me. I've done a number of medical malpractice trials. And I've always settled damages ahead of time. I always try to settle damages. Uh, we were able to settle OHIPS damage. And, and the reason why we had a challenge settling damages is because the defense um, recognize that there could be a different scale of damages depending on which standard of the care issue the plaintiff was successful in. So remember I said earlier that one theory was that it should have just been identified intraoperatively uh, and should have been repaired at that time and she would have been fine. And then the other uh, theory was that it should have been diagnosed five days later, which is better than 21 days later. And if that had been done, uh, the ureter could have been stented or would have been stented likely and that would have led to a better outcome because the uh, treatment would have happened at an earlier time before it could rupture and leak uh, urine into abdomen and cause uh, infection and so on and so forth. So the defense didn't want to settle damages as, as much as I tried to convince them to uh, because they felt, I guess, that um, on the second theory, which was a stronger theory, uh, they didn't want to agree that there were any damages because uh, of their causation uh, opinion that it wouldn't have made any difference anyways even if it had been diagnosed at that five-day mark uh, after uh, it was missed. We did settle OHIP, which was inter interesting. So we'll see how that plays out. But we, we settled it on a different scale. So there was sort of a higher amount for if we met the first one, but then just a slightly lower amount for the second one. In this case, we each called one gynecologist and one urologist. Um, so we tried to keep it short. We actually had extra experts, and we decided to streamline it. Uh, my urologist did comment on cause on standard of care, uh, and the judge reserved whether he would hear that evidence. Uh, I won't get into all the details, but uh, the gist of it was basically had one gynecologist on standard of care and, and a urologist on causation, and the decision is still under reserve. So that was my my first trial experience. I don't know if anyone has any questions about this before I move on to the next one. Yeah. Does the judge know about the, the agreement on OHIP? Yes. Yes, I actually kind of made a, a I hope, uh, helpful submissions on that point. So the defense basically agreed uh, OHIP would be X amount of dollars if the first was met, and then $5,000 less that amount if the second one was met. So if, I, if, if the, there's a breach of the standard of care on the surgery, it was, I'm just going to use a, a number, I don't know if it's public, but let's say $50,000. And then if it was, 
uh, delayed uh, diagnosis standard care was breached, it was 45,000. And so, you know, I think that was helpful for the plaintiff because it showed that it didn't really make a big difference, you know, in terms of the damages. So if you're saying it's 50 or 45, whatever the two numbers are, well, then the general damages should be in that kind of ratio. You know, is it 100 or is it 80? Uh, same with the lost income and, and the other issues that we're arguing about. So even though they didn't settle general damages and the other aspects of it, the fact that we settled OHIP and we settled it, settled it on those relative terms, uh, I think it was helpful. And it would have been a nightmare. Like OHIP's claim, you know, it was, it was a largest claim. And, you know, I've never had to prove an OHIP's claim in a trial before. And I was thinking, you know, I'm going to have to call someone from the Ministry of Health. They're going to go through each line item. We're going to be fighting over a $42 examination and a $200 this. And, you know, it was like a 45 page OHIP summary. And I was just thinking this was really going to be boring and distract from what I wanted to do, which was kind of a quick, easy, straightforward trial in medical malpractice, which, you know, eight days was not bad. Uh, but it was concerning that uh, that might have been a live issue. So uh, it didn't end there for me uh, this year. I went to trial again. Uh, this one was a jury trial in Milton. Um, just started in October. Uh, and this was a case where a plaintiff suffered a comminuted oblique fracture of his tib fib while playing hockey. The defendant orthopedic surgeon recommended treatment with a cast for his fracture. And then after two months of being in a cast, the plaintiff sought a second opinion from another orthopedic surgeon and had immediate surgery. And allegedly due to the delay, he was left with a rotational deformity of his foot. So basically his foot was deformed by about 30 degrees off to the left, which caused a lot of functional issues for him. Man was in his 40s, good health, active guy. Um, quite a an important uh, disability for him. And here's some more medical illustrations. So again, I got medical illustration uh, coming into this trial. And this is an illustration of uh, his right leg at the time that he first was assessed by the orthopedic surgeon. And uh, you can see the angle of the fracture. So you see it's coming down on an angle that's what would be described as an oblique fracture. Uh, it was in multiple fragments and it involved both uh, of his leg bones, so both his tib fib. That was important uh, for our theory of the case because our theory of the case was it was an unstable fracture. That meant that even if you treated it in a cast, um, and even if it seemed to be okay, it probably wasn't going to stay like that. It was probably going to eventually uh, slip out of alignment um, and need surgery later on down the road. So why wait? Why wait to do surgery later on the, down the road? Which the evidence we had was that it would be uh, more complicated because of the development of scar tissue, and it would make for a harder, more difficult surgery that may not be uh, as good of an outcome. So this was an eight-day jury trial in, in October uh, before Justice Mills and Milton. And there is, there is a completely different feeling for doing a jury trial and a, and a judge alone trial. And, you know, one of the things Madam Justice uh, Wilson mentioned is, you know, trying to develop jury questions in the heat of the moment and you got jurors waiting and, you know, it's great as we sit here and analyze it, but the kind of feeling on, you know, three hours of sleep and you're trying to come to agreements on all kinds of things, things kind of just come together in a different way. And sometimes having a bench trial is a little bit, has a better pace to it. But this is an eight day jury trial and I can tell you it was a long eight days uh, for me. Uh, I'd also just had a baby two weeks before. Uh, so, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, a tough one. Damages were settled though. So that was good. Damages were settled. Um, I always wonder how to deal with that with juries. I mean, I, was, I talked to them about it, you know, uh, we settled damages, doing you guys a favor, uh, but don't think it's not serious, right? Because you can, once you settle damages, you're a little bit constrained in terms of how much you can talk about, um, you know, the nature and effect of the, the damages uh, because they're irrelevant. Um, but damages are settled. Um, each of the plaintiff and defense called one orthopedic surgery expert uh, on standard of care and causation. One of the interesting things that came up in this case, which didn't go my way, uh, a couple of things didn't go my way in this case, but one of them was an evidentiary ruling on one of the treating orthopedic surgeons. So as I was saying uh, early on the facts of this case, uh, the gentleman went to this other surgeon who did a surgery and was left with a rotational deformity. I enlisted that surgeon as a treating surgeon to give an opinion that you know, by the time the guy came to me 
uh, there's so much scar tissue and such a difficult surgery, I did the best I could. And had I gotten to him, you know, within a normal time frame of two to three weeks, uh, wouldn't have had a problem because that's my experience in handling these types of surgeries. Uh, to their credit, the defense uh, put up a lot of roadblocks uh, to having that testimony get admitted and basically said that the treating orthopedic surgeon is in a sort of conflict. Not that he did anything wrong. Like, I'm not going to say anything wrong. I wouldn't say that. But you know, it was his surgery that uh, ended up with this deformity. So I don't think he can really talk about, you know, anything to do with that. Um, and unfortunately, um, you know, the, the judge agreed. And so I still had him testify as a fact witness. Um, there are all kinds of uh, really challenging objections during his factual testimony as a physician. He wasn't allowed to part uh, testify as a participant expert, which is sort of, sort of a general exception for treating experts and obviously not as a rule 53 expert. So he basically could read his clinical notes and records. So uh, really not that helpful. And after three hours of deliberations, the jury found no breach of the standard of care. So the case was dismissed. Um, very disappointing outcome, um, you know, for my client and uh, for me. Uh, but these are the realities of uh, litigation. Uh, you can't win them all as much as we'd like to. And unfortunately, yeah, the jury didn't uh, find a breach of the standard of care. Paul, did the doctor serve a report that included an opinion about how the outcome might have been different had he treated earlier? Yes. So why was that not admissible? Because the judge is the gatekeeper to expert evidence and has the jurisdiction to exclude evidence that could be biased. Was it on the basis of bias? No, it wasn't excluded on the basis of bias. Right. It, 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 was, it, was a, it was a challenging one. And because when, when we're arguing the motion, I, I argued just that. I said, you have to find that this expert is biased to exclude their evidence. And there's a Supreme Court of Canada case where it's, it's kind of a high level of bias. And ultimately, it's, it's for the trier fact to decide, you know, if, if there's, you know, issues with, with the reliability of this witness's evidence. But the... Judge just kind of sidestepped that and said, no, it's really just about, you know, he's not the best person. And the other thing that the judge did, and this is something else that we come across, I think, is, you know, the duplication of expert testimony. So the judge was saying, well, Mr. Cahill, you already have an orthopedic surgeon. You have someone who testified on causation. So why do you need this guy? Um, and was sort of of the view that, you know, having multiple experts testifying on the same thing is not an inherently good thing and uh, felt that, uh, you know, my main expert was good enough and I didn't need this guy, even though I really did need this person because he was a guy who was operating on the person. He was in there, he saw the problem and he's probably the best person to comment on causation, but it didn't go that way. That's about all I have to say about those two cases. Um, thank you all for I your time. I have one more question. Of course. Yeah. So, um, I don't know what the damages were, but maybe just talk to us a little bit about how the damages in a particular case affect your case selection. The cases you're going to run with and the cases you may not run with because damages issue. 100%. Yeah, I, 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 will, I will tell you both of these cases were low damages. Um, for medical malpractice. They, they are not the kinds of cases that people practicing in this area would typically want to take on, uh, but they're also six, seven years old. And, you know, I tend, my case selection criteria is guided by really two factors. It's sort of how good of a liability case is it and how likely do I think it might settle and what are the damages? And obviously the stronger the liability case, the lower damages tolerance I have. Uh, and obviously, if there's a higher damages, then I have a higher tolerance for a more difficult liability case. And both of these cases, I felt, were strong liability cases. Um, would I take these cases on today? I don't know. Um, there's a part of me that thinks it's important as medical malpractice lawyers that we do prosecute a certain number of, I think, justifiable medical malpractice cases, regardless of their expense. That being said, um, you know, I can't practice if I don't have money to pay my staff. So I do have to be very careful about the kinds of cases I take on. And like I said, I think these were borderline, probably under what uh, you might want to consider taking on. Yeah, Alan? Well, in this case, under appeal, 
No, it was a jury case. Uh, I lost it fair and square. Clients didn't want to uh, pursue it, and uh, it's not under appeal. Yeah. 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 So, Paul, the, uh, your first case was non jury divisible. Yeah. Um, can you explain the thinking behind the non jury uh, jury decision? Yeah. And, and what your thoughts were about the second case? Yeah, so the question was uh, basically, why did you pick a jury in this case or and not a jury in the other case? And what goes into your thinking about jury and non-jury? So in this case, you recall the this, this fracture looks bad. Like just to kind of simplify, that looks bad. That looks like something that needs surgery. And so when I got the case, I thought, well, that might be a better case for a jury because you know, I, in addition, I have very nice, what I thought, you know, what I do think are nice plaintiffs and, and they would present well, and it looks like a bad fracture that needs surgery. So sometimes I kind of think about what's going to be more amenable to a common sense verdict that may circumvent some junk science that might come up at trial, um, that might be more persuasive to a judge than a jury, uh, things along those natures, and also the, the sympathy factor. If I think that there's more sympathy to a particular plaintiff, um, I like a jury. I do like juries because you get the decision faster and it's harder to appeal. Um, but there's also quite a bit of unpredictability. And I, I don't know what would have happened if the judge decided the case. Uh, on day one, I think I might have lost, but by the end of it, um, coincidentally, the judge, the judge's son had a similar fracture during the trial and was rushed into surgery and uh, told us about it at one of the, the, the charge meetings. And, you know, I said, I wish I didn't have a jury in, the, in that moment, you know? So there's just no way I could have predicted that. Um, so I'd say it's kind of like when I issue a claim, I think about what I feel like more on a particular case at that time. And, and you know, sometimes it, it doesn't always work out and sometimes it does. All right, yeah. good. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.